Thank you, Jillian. Uh, I think a lot of people are still enjoying lunch outside, and I don't blame them. It was actually quite good today, so good. So yesterday we heard about sustainable agriculture. We heard about ethical agriculture. We heard about regenerative agriculture today. And quite honestly, if you're not in the agriculture business, it's very possible you don't really know what we're talking about. So let's talk about what it is. So our conversation today is going to talk about what is regenerative agriculture, why it's important, and how it's being implemented. Then we'll also talk about a couple of things that uh, were research, where it's actually been implemented. What are we learning from that? Some suggestions on a go-forward basis. But before we go there, I thought it'd be really helpful for us to kind of get a grounding on what's happening in agriculture today. Because this is a real interesting topic, okay? So first of all, this is our picture of what a farm looks like. This is what we think, this is what we hope the farms look like. But the reality is far different. We've all heard over the last couple of weeks out here on the West Coast how water is going away. And that's a real issue, right? Historically, agriculture's job was just to feed people. And quite honestly, it's done that job fairly well over the years. But now, agriculture is being asked to do much more. We're being asked to help solve the problems of the climate. And we're going to talk about that because that's where regenerative agriculture comes in. But before we talk about this, let's talk about some of the key challenges that agriculture faces to put it in perspective to kind of set the stage. First of all, arable land. This is the land that you can use to actually farm on is diminishing a great deal. Since 1950, just 71 years ago, the amount of arable land worldwide has decreased 70%. Think about that, 70%. So what used to be able to grow and feed two people, that hectare, that land, that acre, could feed two people, now has to feed six people, okay? So you're really asking that land to step it up and be more productive. And here's another interesting fact. Of that land that we just said is 75%, 70% less than it used to be, 25%, a quarter of it, is severely degraded. And if you look at this map, those red spots, if you will, indicate where it's degraded very severely, but largely because of water concerns. Look at that. There's a lot of issues with water, particularly out here on the West Coast and surprisingly on the East Coast as well, okay? Here's the thing about arable land. It requires water. And according to Bloomberg uh, reports, in four years, half of the world's population, one half of the world's population will be in water-stressed areas. And worldwide, nine out of 10 risks to humanity are tied to water. Think about that, okay? The water issue goes far beyond agriculture. We've all heard about the shortage of semiconductors. Well, Taiwan is the largest manufacturer of semiconductors in the world. They have been in drought conditions, extreme drought conditions, for about 20 months. To make semiconductors, you need a lot of water. That's one of the reasons why we have a shortage today, right? So water goes far beyond agriculture to be an issue. And here's the other scary thought. McKinsey reports that by 2030, eight and a half years from now, think about that, eight and a half years from now, the world will be 40% short of the amount of water needed to feed the world, to supply the water for the plants to grow in this arable land that we've talked about. 40% short. We're not going to have enough water to make all the food we need in 2030, let alone 2050. Okay? So we talked about it. Water concerns are really critical. Here's the interesting stat. Only 2.5% of the world's water is fresh. Only 2.5%. 
Not a whole lot, okay? And what's happening is more and more of that water is becoming polluted. How? A lot of it is agricultural runoff. The fertilizers that have been put on the land have been running off. When you get a big rain event, the rain doesn't get into the soil fast enough. It takes that soil with it. The Chesapeake Bay, Lake Erie, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, all of these issues, all of these areas have issues with polluted water. Now, that has two problems. One, is those, most of that area is fresh water, and now you have polluted. And if you have these kinds of pollution issues, you're emitting nitrogen oxide gases, contributing to climate change. Hopefully, you don't have a severe issue like this in China, but that's how bad it can get if you're not taking care of the soil, okay? The third area that we were going to talk about was soil health, but Willie Petronas is going to be speaking about that in the next presentation, so I took it out of this presentation. But the fourth area that agriculture is concerned with is the lack of food security. Keep in mind, we have a growing world population. It's going to increase 35% between now and 2050. Yet we're going to need 75% more calories to feed that population. Why? Food waste is a big part of that equation. Uh, people are eating more, especially in developing countries where they have access to more food. So we're going to need 75% more calories to feed a population 35% 30 lar larger. But as we said, you've got to grow that 75% more calories on 70% less land than we had 70 years ago. So you're going to really, again, have to ask agriculture to be far more productive than it ever has been in the past. And food insecurity was an issue before the pandemic. The pandemic just made it far more um, relevant, far more important. You will see scenes out of the eastern horn of Africa uh, in uh, Somalia and uh, Yemen and so forth, where you're going to have starving people this year. So food insecurity is a major issue, and we need to address that through agriculture. Okay? And the fifth area of, of issues facing agriculture is greenhouse gases. Agriculture is now being tasked with being a major suck of the carbon emissions that have been floating around forever into the soil. So agriculture is now going to be a major, have a major role in carbon sequestration, okay? Now, in order to meet these challenges, the next generation in agriculture is gonna be what's known as regenerative agriculture. It's, a, it's a, a, a philosophy, it's a thought process, it's a way of life for the agriculture sector to bring conservation and rehabilitation, key point, rehabilitation to food and farming systems, okay? The World Economic Forum last year, the International Monetary Fund last year have both said the future of agriculture is in regenerative agriculture. And we need to be very focused and specific of what those targets are gonna be, okay? So what are, what are those targets, right? We need topsoil regeneration, which Willie will speak a lot more about in the next presentation. We need to increase the biodiversity inside the soil. What do I mean by that? More earthworms, more potato bugs, more bacteria, bacteria in a good sense needs to happen in the soil. Why? That's what sequesters the carbon. We need to improve the water cycle. We don't want that runoff into the rivers. We need to get it into the soil. We need to enhance our ecosystem services to support regenerative agriculture, okay? And we need to help agriculture be far more resilient against climate change. Prime example, what's happening out here on the West Coast, where you just have very high temperatures right now. We've got to make our crops resistant, our land resistant, and resilient to climate change. 
Why is this important? We just talked about the what. Here's the why. Why? Well, there's the lack of food security we talked about. Soil degra degradation. The topsoil is not as vital, not as fertile as it used to be because of the way we've been farming for the last 50 to 60 years. There's some insufficient soil structure, okay? And as a result, water penetration is not happening as fast as it needs to. And with less water, as we talked about, we can't afford to have it running off. We can't have, afford to have the water evaporate, okay? Because that leads to drought. And the, let's be very honest, drought conditions are going to increase over time, okay? The other thing that we need is uh, part of this is NPK. NPK is basically the fertilizer that's typically used. Nitrogen, potassium, phosphate. These are the fertilizers that really have been the key driver in the green revolution that has allowed us to feed all the people that we do have in the world today. There's also calcium and sulfur deficiencies. In the soil, calcium and sulfur are vital for plant nutrition, okay? And we talked about it too when you saw that green river those people, those, those children were swimming in. The fertilizer runoff is a major issue. And oh, by the way, all of this is happening when the demand for organic food is off the charts, particularly in the last year during the pandemic, okay? What are the key drivers that are gonna make regenerative agriculture happen? Think about this, you're a farmer and you've been doing the way you've been working on a farm for generations. You've been tilling the land, you've been putting fertilizer down. That's what you were taught, that's what your father was taught, that's what your grandfather was taught. Now, everyone is asking farmers to make a change. Why? Why? And why are they going to make that change? Well, we, we, we mentioned it yesterday in the one conversation about ethics uh, in growing. Follow the money. And what I mean by this here is that the large food and beverage companies, Pepsi, Nestle, Danone, General Mills, Cargill, and many, many others have all said in the last six months, in the last six months, have said they're gonna go to regenerative agriculture. They're gonna push their supply chain to go through regenerative agriculture. Why? The consumers want that change. You've heard that come up across several times during the last day and a half on the presentations. Consumers want change. They want more sustainability. Why? The retailers are gonna force to change. Walmart has said, Sainsbury, which is the second largest retailer in the UK, have both said, if you don't do this, Mr. Supplier, we're not buying your product. Think about that for a second. And Walmart, which is the second largest grocery chain in the United States, has said, for you that are supplying my produce, my vegetables, if you don't do this, we're not buying from you. Okay, so the retailers are changing. The financial industry is noticing. As I said yesterday in a comment, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, the largest uh, financial company in the world, right? JP Morgan, Chase Manhattan Bank, have all said that if you don't have sustainability metrics in your business, we're not going to give you preferred funding. You're gonna pay a penalty for not having those sustainability measures. Well, guess what? The Pepsis, Danones, Nestle's, they need that money and they don't wanna pay more than they have to. So they're gonna follow where the money leads. The food and beverage industry is changing. It's starting now. This is all within the last six months. It's going to be rapid and it's going to be costly, okay? As I mentioned, all these companies have said, this is gonna happen. Whoop, I'm gonna go back one. I double clicked, I think. Oh, okay. So, we talked about the what, we talked about the why. Let's talk about the how. What are we talking about when we talk about regenerative agriculture? 
The Soil Health Institute, which is the leading proponent of regenerative agriculture in this country, says that there are four best practices that you should apply to regenerative agriculture. Number one, cover crops. So historically, when you would harvest your crop, you'd leave that ground just bare. Now what they're saying is, once you harvest the crop, plant some, some additional grasses of some sort or other types of crops on top. They may not be cash bearing crops, but they will protect the soil during the winter period, okay? Improve soil health and infiltration. Tilling has been around since biblical times. How many times have you seen movies where they got the cow hooked up with a harness to the till and they just go through the land and then they plant the seeds? Tilling's been around forever. And they're saying now, don't do that because it destroys the topsoil. It takes 100 years to repair topsoil. So you can't afford to destroy the topsoil you'll have. Nutrient management. These are the fertilizers we talked about, that MPK. Manage those so that you can use less of them. Be more precise in where you apply them and how you apply them. And then crop rotation, which quite frankly has been around forever. Okay? These are the four basic principles and practices that are recommended to move into regenerative agriculture. But if you're not there right now, and I start to make that change, it's three to five years before these all start to play out and maximize their benefit and potential, okay? So what's in it for the farmer? Because this is important. Why would the farmer want to do this? They've been doing things like this for generations. Why make the change? Well, at the end of the day, if you want to sell to Pepsi or Danone or General Mills or Walmart, you better make the change, right? And it's not cheap to make that change. Also, it does provide better land and soil stewardship. You talk to any farmer and they will tell you that they're stewards of the land first. So this will help them be better stewards. The other thing that's happening that has really gained momentum in the last six months are carbon markets. All right, these are uh, markets that pay people to sequester carbon wherever, in this case, in the soil. So these carbon markets are exploding in the industry right now. And they're coming and saying, you do these four principles that we just talked about, we will pay you to capture more carbon in the, in the soil. That's great, because now their land becomes a cash crop. So in addition to whatever they were selling before, wheat, corn, lettuce, whatever the case may be, their soil now can drive income for the farm. And therefore, you can drive some significant economic gains. This is all proven, and there are some results. So let's take a look at this. General Mills began implementing regenerative farming and agriculture about two years ago on a pilot basis. They worked with 24 wheat farms in Kansas, 54 oat and grain farms in Canada, and their goal by 2030 is to be in a million acres, okay? And it was working. They had some huge successes and they definitely were able to demonstrate that they were able to sequester carbon, which is at the end of the day, the key goal here. One of the key goals is capture that carbon. But there's a challenge here, nature. Nature gets in the way. What do I mean? They had some significantly dry conditions up in Canada that led to a grasshopper infestation. Think about that. No one ever thinks about that. The grasshoppers were so large, they ate the crop. So they had to put pesticides down in order to deal with the grasshoppers. That was not part of the plan. That's part of the nutrient management concept we talked about. You don't want to put pesticides down, but they had to because nature got in the way. Danone has been on the forefront of this as well. They've been doing it for three years now. Their pilot program is 82,000 acres. 64% of those used cover crops we talked about. 77% used no-till practices. And they 
estimate they've captured 80,000 tons of carbon in that soil. Oh, excuse me, 20,000 tons sequestered, and they avoided 80,000 tons through not having to uh, till. You know, you take your tractor to till it. You take your tractor to put the um, fertilizer down. By, by eliminating that, they eliminated those carbon emissions that go along with it. So they believed that they were able to sequester roughly 100,000 tons of carbon. Not bad, not bad. But again, the challenge. Nature gets in the way. What do I mean? Some soils were so full of clay that they had to till. Because it was too hard, the seeds could not penetrate into the soil to grow. Okay? No-till is one of the four practices. So my point that I'm making here is these four practices are recommended, and that's important, and that's good. But nature has its own game. And sometimes you have to adapt, okay? Okay? In this point, what I mean is we can't rely on the old best practices, cover crops, no-till, nutrient management, and crop rotation. We need to put more arrows in the quiver, more bullets in the chamber, if you will, that gives us more options depending on the very different climates, the very different soil conditions, the very different geographies. Because what is best out in the Midwest and on the East Coast may not work in Arizona, may not work in Colorado or California. So we need to broaden the tools available to use in regenerative agriculture. The NGOs, the advocacy groups, the carbon marketers, big food and beverage, they must seek new solutions, new combinations of existing practices, and drive innovation to help meet that challenge. Right now, they're not thinking that way, to be very honest. They're not. They're very, very focused on these four practices. Why is this important? My company is doing some research with Colorado State University and the University of Arizona to test new options in their soil conditions. We're working with four different farmers in that region, and they will tell you that in Arizona, they don't use cover crops. Why? Because they can turn it over because of the sun and the heat. They can actually do a, cover, a, a, a cash crop. Harvest one cash crop, go right into the next one. So they don't need to do a cover crop. In Arizona, there also is going to be some research that will be published this week that says that no-till may actually be counterproductive to carbon sequestration in Arizona because of the uniqueness of its soil structure. So my point is we need to think differently and broaden our tool set because Different climate conditions, different geographical areas are not cookie cutters, right? They can't, they, not everything works the same way across the board. So part of the answer might be the use of calcium sulfate dehydrate. You may know it as gypsum. Very commonly used in uh, uh, wallboard, but high purity gypsum is very well known in agriculture. In fact, there are, the USDA recommends twice uh, to use it under certain circumstances, okay? So we think that you might use calcium sulfate dehydrate to improve the soil structure to begin with that will then enable the other four practices to work better, okay? We know that those regenerative agriculture practices take three to five years to maximize their benefits, whereas the use and application of CSD can take one to start demonstrating application. So the idea is, by using the two different sets of practices, two plus two equals six. You get two years of benefits from the regenerative agriculture, maybe four years benefits from the CSD. The point here is that change is clear. The need, the case for change is clear. We need to change how we have been farming for centuries. We need to change how we are approaching land. But we also need to change in terms of the best practices that we use. Okay? 
the recommended best practices do work, but they have some limits, and we need to open up the toolbox and create more options for us to move forward. We've got to strive to innovate. We've got to develop these new ideas. We've got to try new combinations. We've got to continually to test to meet this challenge. Because when you look at it, 70% less arable land, 40% of the water is going to be, we're going to be short 40% of the water needed to make the food necessary in eight and a half years. These are compelling reasons why change has to happen. And we need to continue to innovate to make this work. So let's go and improve our best practices for regenerative agriculture. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Make me run around more. That's all right. Good. How you doing? Fine, thank you. So I, I, I've seen the discussions about soil conservation and everything else, and I was having a discussion, in fact, with my colleague last night about how about alternate stuff? How about no soil? How about using the ocean for alternative things where there's no nutrients needed, just water? Or how about cricket powder? I mean, cricket's the new kale. How about re-educating the public to eat algae to make chocolate chirp cookies? Because it's already happening. If you go to the Texas State Fair, there's an explosion in insect-based protein. Now, it sounds gross to a lot of people, but when they don't know what's ground up in a powder and put into other things, that might be an alternative. And, and I'm not knocking you whatsoever. Everything you're saying is spot on, but there are other things that are even more regenerative than you're talking about. I'm not going to disagree uh, with that statement at all. But what I will say is things take change. There's not going to be enough crickets, not enough seaweed in the foreseeable future to feed all the people that current agriculture does. Not to mention the amount of people around the world that work in agriculture. When you go to some of these markets in Africa, for example, and in Asia, 25% of the GDP of some of these countries is agriculture. They employ 30 to 35% of the people. So you can't walk away from the infrastructure that exists. You can tweak it, and that's what we're suggesting. What you're suggesting will happen I don't think it'll be 100% to re replicate what you're talking about. So we're going to have to find and work along the way for both to, to, to work, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great answer. And it wasn't a canned question. You were spot on, ready to go. I'm sorry? <laughs> what was that? It wasn't a canned question. You were spot on, ready to go. OK. Good. Well, thank so, you. Uh, my, my question, I guess, relates more to the realities of scale. You, uh, over here. Uh, oh. You had pos positioned the, you know, the example you gave and so forth, very large scale, big business, um, very large scale farms as well. And so granted now, you know, it, just to give an example, the, the, the world of food that we buy in food service, 50% of its chains and, and restaurants and so forth, and 50% is grocery in our food system, give or take, right? right? Mm -hmm. it, it changes and so forth. So yet on the side of the fence that you're on, the agricultural side, the majority of the food for both of those systems is coming from bigger ag, right? And so I get that oh. it's most important at the biggest scale, but is there application for this at lesser size scales in the agricultural world um, you know, that make a lot of sense? Yeah, so in answer to your question, the answer is yes. At the end of the day, all of agriculture is gonna have to move in this direction. Just to give you a little sense of perspective of how much opportunity there is, in the United States, there are 894 million acres. Think about that number. 894 million acres dedicated to agriculture. In this country alone, only 6% are using these regenerative agriculture practices that we've just talked about. 6%. So the answer to your question, Jonathan, is there's a lot of opportunity for everybody. Small to large. My sense is it'll be the smaller farmers that are going to adapt it fastest. Can't deal with the opportunity Yeah, yeah, and benefit, exactly. Because big, big ag is big for a reason, right? It has scale, but it also has a lot of infrastructure established and a lot of tradition along with it. It's a big change, we're asking. But again, it's going to need to happen. And if they want to maintain their business with their customers, they're going to have to. Any other questions? If I could just uh, add to the uh, comment that was made, 
we find that uh, most of the guys that, that actually move into regenerative agriculture find that their the operations become too big for them. They can actually produce the same amount and more food on a smaller hectare of their, or a, a, a smaller area of, of their farm. It's a, it's, it's a common, it's a common uh, uh, phenomenon that, that we find as soon as the guys become really regenerative. Because there's a stage when you do move from a conventional to completely regenerative. And then I just wanted to add one, one other uh, thing about climate change or uh, global, global warming. We, we can have as many Kyoto and Paris agreements as, as what we want. Um, the atmosphere is loaded with, with, with CO2. And the, there's also another issue that, that, that causes it, which is, which is the uh, um, water hazes. But uh, carbon dioxide track, tracks those uh, uh, tendencies. And the only way we're going we're gonna to solve that problem is by getting what is already in the atmosphere back into the soil, and the only practical way is regenerative agriculture. There is no other way. So to your two points, the good news is, is if you get the crop yield increases you're talking about, that's what's going to help feed a 35% larger population when you have 70% less land. So we need for our land to be far more productive. So it's good news that the regenerative agriculture does work in that respect. I do believe, to your point also, Willie, that soil, because it's everywhere, right, is the biggest opportunity to draw and capture carbon. No question about it. It will be the biggest draw. But I think what we need to be looking at is what other areas of opportunity are there to prevent emissions? Is that electrical cars? Is that other areas of opportunity that we can use to help prevent emissions going forward because that's a big monkey on the back of agriculture to say you need to take all of it. And I don't think that's a fair statement. I think we as a collective organization of humans need to find as many possible solutions as possible. Agriculture is definitely one of the leaders, but we need to find more. Thank you. Uh, I would have a follow-up question on the point you made on cash crops as an additional new revenue stream for farmers, just to get a sense of like, how important that revenue stream can become. Do you have any numbers for a traditional farmer in the United States for one acre, how much money can they get out of yeah. reduction of carbon emission, and what percentage is that of the traditional revenue they would get from, from the harvest? You know, the carbon markets are relatively new, and they're still trying to find a, a center as to where it's going to be. The Congress literally on Monday passed a law that will help regulate the carbon markets that are out there to provide technical assistance to farmers to figure out how to leverage these carbon markets, how to implement regenerative agricultural practices. So that passed on Monday. So that's really good news. Right now, the carbon markets only about 15% of the credit actually gets to the farmer. Personally, I think that's a crying shame because that means that middle person is making a lot of money, right? More money needs to get to the farmer because they're doing all the work. Uh, to that point, it's small as a result. We're talking $20 an acre. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Farmers work on pretty small margins, pretty small margins. $20 an acre can be very meaningful for a farmer, but quite frankly, it still needs to be more. Yes. Um, what would this mean to the consumer you know, financially at the bottom line um, as these things progress? Ah, good question. Um, it's very possible that you may need to pay a little bit more as this transition happens but the consumer is not going to want to, and the retailer is not going to want to charge more. So it's going to come on the back of the farmer. And that's why $20 needs to be 30, because they need to cover these costs. This is not an inexpensive transition. So they're going to need to cover those costs. Hopefully, the carbon credits will help offset that. Hopefully, as part of this new legislation that was passed on Monday, 
there'll be support from the U.S. government to help make that transition happen. Because it's not, like I said, it's not inexpensive. And hopefully, as a result, that'll keep prices at least level to where they are today. That's the goal. Because if you have a, a higher crop yield as well, you'll be able to maintain those costs. Hi, I'm Tomoyuki Iwanami from Manda Fermentation. Um, I used to be involved in this program called Pre-Organic Cotton. Basically, this helped the transition from conventional farming to organic farming because it takes three years for that mm -hmm. transitional period. And what we did was we would purchase the cotton at a premium price for mm -hmm. these farmers to help support this. Right. Um, my question is, uh, I'm a little familiar with the Regen farming, but are there any programs currently or even uh, some kind of help from the government? You kind of already said this, but to help these farmers transition from their current farms to these Regen farms. Okay, so, so what you're talking about is the transition from conventional to organic. You are allowed to try to charge what's called a transition price because organic farming is significantly more expensive and the product price will be significantly more expensive as a result. So during that transition period, you can charge a transition price. That is a factor of the marketplace. For the transition to regenerative farming, uh, I think the government's gonna have to step in and I also think that the big businesses, the Pepsis, the Danones, the General Mills, are gonna have to pay a little bit to help during that transition period. Nobody has said they were gonna do that, but I'd be very surprised that if not underneath uh, the PR announcements and so forth, that they're offering their farmers transitional funds. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen either, because farmers can't do it by themselves. They're gonna need that help. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.